Life Audio. This is Empowering Homeschool Conversations. We want families to come here and gain insightful strategies that empower them to successfully teach diverse learners at home. Hosted by founder and CEO of Sped Homeschool, Peggy Ployer. Our goal is that these powerful weekly conversations will boost your confidence to cultivate the best at-home learning environment for your student. For more homeschool resources, go to spedhomeschool.com. You're listening to Empowering Homeschool Conversations with Peggy Ployer. We'll start the conversation with Peggy and her guests next. It's a crazy world out there, moms and dads. I'm Katherine Seegers, host of Christian Parent Crazy World, the podcast that tackles tough topics to help you be a godly parent in an ungodly world. Subscribe at lifeaudio.com. The Historical Jesus Podcast is the sweeping saga of the life and times of Galilean Jesus of Nazareth, as well as the faith, religion, and church founded to honor and disseminate his acts and teachings. Join me, Mark Vinette, on this fascinating journey through time, exploring the many great works of Christian theology, literature, architecture, music, and art inspired by the words and deeds of Jesus Christ. This is Empowering Homeschool Conversations, provided by Sped Homeschool, a nonprofit that empowers families to home educate diverse learners. To learn more, visit spedhomeschool.com. Here's Peggy Ployer. I always ask my guests when they first get started to share just a little bit about themselves and their family. Now, I know you're a homeschooler as well mm-hmm. and a busy, busy homeschool mom because you also run a co-op. Mm-hmm. And so you've got a lot of things going on. For sure. <laughs> yes. So um, so tell us a little bit about your family and then we'll kind of dive into maybe why you're so passionate about this topic. Okay. Um, I've got a husband and we've been married for 25 years. It'll be actually 26 uh, next week. And hey, congratulations. So, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've got a son that's 20. So I've graduated one. Yay. That feels good. <laughs> uh, I've got a 17 year old daughter that's a senior this year. So can awesome. see the light at the end of the tunnel for right. her. And then my baby is a 13 year old who's um, muddling through eighth grade wow. this year who asked me if she could take a gap year between eighth grade <laughs> and high school. <laughs> you know, well, that's not a bad idea. I was like, oh, uh, <laughs> that's not a thing. Uh, but it did make me laugh. Yes. It did make me laugh. Oh, <laughs> well, that's great. <laughs> so we've been homeschooling the whole time. Um, my son did do, end up doing kindergarten at a private school, but okay. that was Not because we wanted to go to private school, but just because I needed some help. I had him and the toddler and I was pregnant with the, with the baby. And so we just did that and, um, and it was okay, but, um, not the, still not the best fit. So we've been home ever since and, and we've all always done all of our academics at home. Um, we've, I've just barely started to outsource a few classes, probably in retrospect, I should have done a little bit more as they got into high school. But I always thought, well, I can teach everything. I got good grades in high school and college. Like I can teach all this stuff. Right. Not really realizing that it was also important for them to learn to be responsible to someone else. Right. That is and really important in those high school years. Absolutely. So we've done a little bit more of that now with the second one and we'll probably do a little bit more. I think uh, I kind of gradually did the same thing. And my mm-hmm. oldest, I never, you know, I, he did unit studies. Everything was at home. Mm-hmm. And then my middle one, well, he kind of just decided he wanted to write his own curriculum too. And then <laughs> and my youngest, I did end up outsourcing a lot more. And then she begged me to teach her math. So mm-hmm. I ended up back teaching math, but it, it was a good fit. It just, she just really needed that personal interaction. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's just every child's so different. And, so true. But, but I think you do, as you homeschool longer, you learn to let go mm-hmm. and realize I don't have to be everything mm-hmm. for everybody. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's totally my tendency. Right. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of us just are we mm-hmm. as we we dive into homeschooling and and want to do our best for our kids and so yeah so yeah so we're talking about nutrition today and I would love for you to share just a little bit about how your nutrition journey started because I think we all we all have some sort of story 
Otherwise, mm-hmm. we'd still be kind of going on the same path as we started out on and say, what? You know, I eat mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but there's 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 usually something that happens along that that path that goes, puts you in check. Mm hmm. Well, I grew up uh, in Texas eating just whatever my mom fixed for me. I know that we never had a lot of money, so we weren't right. eating, you know, what I, quality food, I guess. There was a time that we were even on, um, I don't know, government subsidized. I forget what it was called when I was little, but I know we went yeah. and picked up government cheese sometimes oh, yes. or uh-huh. something like that. Yeah, we did too. So... It wasn't really until I got a little bit older, you know, as I think as you're a teenager and you start getting like body conscious and, you know, that right. kind of thing happens that I thought, oh, maybe I should be careful about what I eat. And I think that also coincided with the nationwide and probably worldwide low fat craze. Oh, yes. That kind of I happened remember when that happened. Exactly. Back in then. So I was in mm-hmm. high school, like early 90s. And um, I thought, oh, yeah, that makes sense, right? Don't eat fat, and then you won't won't get fat. fat. Right. (laughs) It seems to make sense. Right. Well, it kind of, yeah, seemed to at the time. So I kind of, you know, just started kind of watching what I ate uh, a little bit to me. I thought I was eating healthy. And then, um, and I never had any like health issues or never any weight issues. So I thought everything was, you know, just fine, Mm -hmm. just fine. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And it really wasn't until I got pregnant with my first child. Um, so I was 25 and, um, I was seeing a midwife cause I had just okay. started to kind of get into that realm. I was kind of of the opinion at first, like, well, if I had the option to like not feel pain during childbirth, Oh, why, yeah. Why yeah, would I, I not think do we that? all kind of seek that out? <laughs> and but I was so fortunate to be going to a church with a, a chiropractor that was our actually our Bible study teacher. Wow. And so he and his wife had a practice and his sister also practiced with them. And she really just made it a point to talk to me about, well, you know, have you thought about this? And have you thought about this? And I was like, oh, no, I really haven't. I haven't thought about any of that. Right. So that started a little bit of the journey. They actually pointed me to a midwife and I thought, well, that sounds kind of cool. So I was actually seeing an OB-GYN and the midwife at the same time, just because I thought, well, you know, second opinion kind of thing while I'm trying this out. Yes. (laughs) Well, the midwife asked me at one point to write down a food log of everything that I ate for a couple of days. And then she wanted to see that at my next appointment because she was all about nutrition, preventing all these complications of pregnancy, like that you can prevent preeclampsia and the high blood pressure and the, uh, the gestational diabetes and all these things by controlling your diet while you're pregnant. So I was like, okay, I'll write down everything. So I turned it in and she kind of looks at me like, really? frosted mini wheats for breakfast <laughs> and I was like what it's what? whole wheat like right. that's, <laughs> and that's they fine. have vitamins added don't they <laughs> right and it was like you know ham and cheese sandwich for lunch but whole wheat bread like it's yes, fine yes. <laughs> and then for dinner you know uh pork chops and rice aroni and canned green beans and I was like that's uh, the three food groups on the plate, like I, I got right. this right. This yeah. is great. That's how I grew up eating. <laughs> yes, and she was like, "Oh, honey, uh, we need, <laughs> we need to talk about this." And so I was like, "Oh, really? Like very, like oh, what I." Th- I thought I was doing the right thing. Right. She was very big about getting um, a very high amount of protein while you're pregnant. She's like, oh. "Babies are made out of protein." you need to be eating a lot of protein, all the building blocks for all of the cells and all this stuff. I think she was advising at that time, like 80 to 90 grams of protein a day, which I was like, oh my goodness, how am I going to do that? So there I was all of a sudden eating almonds all the time. And I mean, I even had like beef jerky. I was teaching um, in public school at the time. So I needed to have like, you know, snacks. Snacks. You know how you're just hungry all the time. So I was eating... Well, I really ate a lot of dairy then too. I was cottage cheese and cheese and boiled eggs and all these things to try to get that much protein. But I mean, during the whole pregnancy, I felt great. I didn't have any problems. I gained exactly 25 pounds, you know, like they're, say you're supposed to. Right. And 
I mean, everything went just perfectly. So I was like, okay, well, you know, maybe huh. there is something to this. Right. But as you can imagine, my husband was maybe a little slower to come along. Right. And he's like, why, you know, why can't we have, you know, biscuits and gravy and stuff for breakfast now? And yeah. um, so my plan at that time was to just start tweaking our diet, but just like a little by little. Because right. I thought, um, fortunately, my husband to. is not picky. So he'll eat anything that I put in front of him generally. So I thought if I just change little by little and he won't really notice, it won't be that big of a deal. And that actually worked extremely well. I picked breakfast Okay. and I started reforming breakfast. I was like, okay, no more frosted mini (laughs) wings for breakfast. (laughs) Let's make some choices with some less sugar and and stuff like that. So we did better and I felt like I got breakfast to a good place. And then I started working on lunch and making better choices for what we ate for lunch, less processed meat and, you know, less dairy. And then, uh, then we worked on dinner a little bit at a time. Got it. So I was able to really make a lot of changes and, uh, and he was able to go along with it. Like I said, cause, cause he wasn't uh, that picky, which is, which is great, but also it was so gradual that he honestly didn't even notice for a long time that anything was changing. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you do make those little changes, it's a lot easier instead of going full bore. And then people are like, in your family going, how long is this going to last? Mm-hmm. <laughs> how long do I have to tolerate it? And um, yeah. After a word from our sponsor, we'll dive back into this conversation. There's no better way to start your day than spending time in God's word and in prayer. Don't know where to start? We have a free daily prayer podcast created to help you do just that. The Your Daily Prayer podcast delivers a thoughtful, devotional, and timely prayer to you seven days a week. Gain inspiration, faith, and encouragement with daily messages in 10 minutes or less. To start listening now, search Your Daily Prayer on your favorite podcast app or visit lifeaudio.com. This is Empowering Homeschool Conversations, provided by Sped Homeschool. Go to spedhomeschool.com to get resources and support for teaching your unique learner at home. But they say that the more you're exposed to a certain foods, like new foods, it's going to take you a little while to get used to them. Mm-hmm. But then over time, you just acclimate mm-hmm. to them. Because I, I suppose now... If you went back to your old diet, you know, your family would probably like it a little bit, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's just not what they're used to. Anymore. Right. And that, and that, especially once I had the baby and I was like, oh, like this is my responsibility to raise him. So my goal was get them used to real food and their palate will acclimate to that so that when they have fake food or stuff that's not healthy, it won't be as appealing Right. So, I mean, you know, kind of mixed results uh, there as they have gotten into adulthood. Food engineering has made (laughs) bad food taste good. (laughs) That that does make it difficult. But, I mean, there were a few successes. Like the first time my daughter, we were traveling or something and we stopped and she had a a grilled cheese sandwich with like American cheese, which she had never had before. Uh She threw it up. Like, I was like, oh, okay, well, good. We knock that off the list for us. I made a point of telling her that was that kind of cheese and that is not good for you. So you should not eat it. She was like, okay. (laughs) Never wanted it again. Oh, wow. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're kind of talking a little bit more like diet. How does that relate to nutrition? And is there a difference between the two? Mm Mm-hmm. So to me, um, and I know people can define it a little bit differently, but to me, diet is whatever you're eating. Okay. Uh, whatever you are putting in your mouth is your diet. Of course, people like to say, I'm going on a diet. Uh, well, you're already on one. Yes, um, that's true. You can change your diet, um, but it's it's whatever food you're eating. You know, you've heard of keto diet or a low carb or paleo right. or, you know, this or that, gluten-free diets, all these things. But really the diet just encompasses everything that you're putting into your mouth. Got it. So if we created a food log, that would be our diet of what we've been eating. Mm-hmm. And you've also heard the standard American diet. Yes. What the acronym <laughs> is. 
instead, <laughs> right. standard American <laughs> diet, because it's typically not very nutrient dense and um, a lot of packaged and processed foods. So yeah, that would be one too, to definitely avoid. Right. So yeah. then I would mm-hmm. say nutrition is what is in the food. Got it. What is in your diet? Um, people sometimes will track their, it's kind of a trendy thing, I think, tracking your macros. I'm just going to track my macros. Well, that they mean macronutrients. Okay. So the big groups being fats and proteins and carbs. So sometimes people will try to, you know, control their weight or uh, whatever by controlling what percentage of calories you get from these three different groups. Okay. Which can yeah. be effective. Um, but that also, you're not, thinking also about the whole picture still. I think thinking about vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients that are in or supposed to be in the food that we're eating. And that's where the true nutrition comes from. So you said supposed to be. So so what what actually can we get out of the food that we eat? Well the sad fact is that even if you're eating a really healthy diet, say you are eating lots of veggies, you're eating lots of fruits. Um, If these are all things that you are getting from the grocery store, then they just don't have the nutrition in it that we, that we truly need. I mean, there's a whole big course, long story that we could go into about farming practices and how they have changed over the years. But I mean, if you think about it, right there, it's very simple. If there's a whole field where you're growing tomatoes and you grow the tomatoes and then they grow more tomatoes there the next time and grow more tomatoes, right. doesn't it make sense that they have used up all the stuff in the soil to make good tomatoes? Right. Over time, you're right. nothing. In- and even if they fertilize... Typically, they're only fertilizing with a couple of things, you know, some potassium in there and some, you know, there and some magnesium. They're not fertilizing with the full array of vitamins and minerals that ought to be in the soil. And the fertilizer that they're using is not likely something that's natural. It's probably a chemical chemical. that was made and potassium made in a lab is just not the same as potassium found in nature. So it doesn't get absorbed the same way into the plant, which means it doesn't get absorbed into our bodies in the same way either. So as hard as we may try and as, as good as you may think that your diet is, it's just not the same. I mean, I've seen some statistics where it said um, Mm -hmm. you would have to eat 60 cups of spinach today to equal one cup of the spinach nutrients from a hundred years ago. That's crazy. I can't eat that much spinach. No, exactly. And not even if you cook it down. <laughs> no. And I mean, that's just that one, you know, the amount of iron in the spinach or whatever, like, but that's just right. to show a, a, a degradation of our nutrients overall. So I think if you are not supplementing with vitamins and minerals, then you're missing yeah. a big part of your health picture and you, you are deficient. It's just a matter of times before some symptoms may show. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about supplementation. Is um, there a good understanding of, you know, where do you start? Um, How do you find out then what you're maybe most efficient in? Mm -hmm. Because we probably all have certain areas where our diet, because of the way we eat, we're, you know, some levels might be high, some might be low. Um, Or if people are even supplementing, they may be supplementing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Well, it's almost safe to say we probably need everything. Um, (laughs) But I would say the most important place to start is to get a quality supplement. Whatever you're going to do, make sure it is high quality. Because if you're thinking, well, I'll just run down to Walmart and grab some, you know, women's one a day off the shelf. Um, I got bad news for you. That's, that's, that's not really going to work. And well, and here's why those, just like I was saying about the fertilizer, those vitamins were all created in a lab, right? They're all chemically reproduced. And even if, um, it has like the same name, it's not the same thing as that being in nature. So, uh, like say, uh, vitamin C, 
is not just found as ascorbic acid all by itself. It's surrounded by other what they call cofactors, itty bitty little things that we don't know the name of and that, I mean, that are vitally important, even though we don't really know about them, but they surround the vitamin C or the vitamin E or the vitamin whatever. And that's how they're found in nature. Your body needs those cofactors in order to metabolize that nutrient. When you buy it from Walmart, it does not have those cofactors. So you're getting the ascorbic acid and your body's like, oh, thanks, great. All right, well, I need these cofactors to metabolize it. So it starts grabbing these cofactors from somewhere else in your body and then it can metabolize it. So you might feel a little bit of improvement if you're on a vitamin for a short time, but then your body is going to run out. You need yourself of everything else. Right. You're out of the cofactors. And so then you'll typically have like, you know, a fall off of energy or whatever thing that particular nutrient was supposed to be doing. So you've got to make Mm -hmm. sure that it's reputable and even like ideally it's made from plant or animal sources. Right. To where they get this plant, they have figured out which part of the plant is the highest concentration of whatever this nutrient is. They can, you know, freeze dry it or whatever and, yeah. you know, pack it into tablets and, and then you take it. You And like if you look on the labels of those kinds of supplements, okay. um, you would see like, you know, vitamin C and it might say like, 12%. And you're like, well, that's not very much. This one I have over here says vitamin C 3000%. Right. <laughs> so it seems like that's better and even like, you know, a better value or a better buy, but right. it's really not. Cause again, that one doesn't have the cofactors. It's going to be robbing exactly. your body from everywhere else. This one has the cofactors and that's actually how a really good way to tell if the supplement is real is because it, it, it doesn't have percentage. a super high percentage listed. So if you get a quality one, um, that's a great place to start. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it, it's something that we definitely don't learn by going to a regular doctor. Mm-hmm. I, I'd never heard that before <laughs> from a regular yeah. doctor. Sadly, I mean, again, that's another statistic you'll hear that doctors go to medical school for a long, long time time, probably eight years. And usually the amount of time that they spend talking about nutrition is like an hour. Wow. Like literally one hour of one class, one time. And they're like, yeah, you know, there's a bunch of vitamins and here's the name of them. And okay, we're moving on. Right. It's just not part of the medical study in a typical medical school. So your doctor just doesn't know. Right. So let's talk about deficiencies Mm -hmm. and how do we even know if we have a deficiency? Well, there are a lot of ways that deficiencies are going to show up. And some of them, I mean, they can be very, very subtle and they can be very huge. You just kind of have to know what to look for. I would say any sort of pain that you are in. The pain is a signal that something right. is not right. Yeah. That's there for a reason. You should respond to it. Um, there can also be, I mean, even small things like the color of your eyes or your eyes just looking dull. Right. Your tongue, if it has a big um, canyon down the middle of it, or mm-hmm. if it looks like it's uh, waxy or coated. Your fingernails, if you don't have a, a lunula, um peeking out from the fingernails or if they have ridges or your heels could be cracked, um, skin things, eczema. I mean, anything where your body is like not right, hair thinning, very waxy ears. I mean, a persistent cough, um, being cold all the time or being hot all the time or, I mean, all of these is a sign that something is not, God created you to be in perfect working order. Right. So if you are not, then that's something that we should pay attention to. And again, most uh, traditional doctors are not trained to look for those small things. Um, 
So I would advise seeking out, you know, a nutritionist, uh, a functional doctor, a chiropractor, something in that kind of realm, even an acupuncturist. Typically, they would have more training in picking out those little small signs. It's like a a check engine light Mm -hmm. on your car. So you don't just ignore that. Well, some people do. (laughs) And then put tape over it. Yeah, yeah. That's a good solution. (laughs) It gets into a bad place. So you want to... It's like a lotion or a a medication that we use. Exactly. Instead of... Mm -hmm. Oh, I've got this eczema spot. I'm going to give you this cream and put on it. But that's not addressing the root issue of why that is happening. And that's where I feel like the big disconnect in traditional medicine is they don't look for a cause. They just treat the symptom most of the time. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's a journey though. And that's sure. that I think it, it's really hard because we live in this day and age where there, we want a simple solution to the problem we have, which ends up being mm-hmm. a pill. And a lot of people mm-hmm. aren't willing to swallow the larger pill that says, no, you've got to change. Right. <laughs> you've got to do something different. And what you're doing right now is leading to that. Mm-hmm. And it may take a long time because I, at least from my experience, I know that deficiencies sometimes take a long time to mm-hmm. replenish mm-hmm. as well. And so that, that can be a journey and it seems like nothing's happening for a long time mm-hmm. too. So we were talking before we started the broadcast about um, blood tests mm-hmm. and finding deficiencies. Um, do you want to share any little bit about that and what, what somebody be looking for in a blood test that could show those deficiencies. Mm-hmm. Well, a typical blood panel that you're going to get, you know, in a blood work for a doctor, you will typically have to ask for a full blood panel. If you'll just ask for some blood work, you know, they may run a couple of things and not even run like a full diagnostic that you would want to see. But there, it's yeah. going to show a lot of things. They'll count your red blood cells and your white blood cells and count your platelets and, you know, check for all kinds of things. Um But even with a full blood panel to look at results, okay, so you have them. And of course, you and I were like, "Uh, what is all that stuff? What are eosinophils? I don't know what those (laughs) neutrophils are. Um, And again, a lot of doctors aren't super trained to look. They just kind of, they can see what we can see. There's that little column where it's like high, low, normal. And right, like, exactly. Okay. Then you look through and go, what's on the red? Because that must be what I have to pay attention to. Mm-hmm. And so if it was that simple, right, then you and I could do this and we'd be like, all right, I'm high right there. And so I'll take care of that. Yeah. But I would say to look beyond that and um, which just, it takes some training. It takes some expertise. Again, the, the mm-hmm. functional medicine doctor, um, yeah. you know, a nutritionist, they would be able to read into that a little bit deeper and maybe even see things before they pop up as symptoms. Right. Because, I mean, my nutritionist says your liver can be 80% diseased before it shows up on a wow. liver panel because our liver is so resilient, resilient. and it'll keep exactly. doing what it's supposed to be doing mm-hmm. and it'll keep trying, but you could be in really deep trouble before it actually shows up on a test. Wow. Yeah. And it's inside us. It's not like we can check it. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, it's not like our skin that's you know mm-hmm. showing different things. So, well, and there are some, sense. even some other tests like, um, I mean, I think gut health is huge. I mean, oh, yeah. top, top priority. Some people would say 80% of disease starts in the gut. Some would say 100% of disease wow. starts in the gut. So if your gut is not healthy, you're just going to be prone to to a lot more things. Think about it. You're not, not digesting the food that you're exactly. eating. You might not even be digesting your supplements that you're taking. Right. Uh, that happened to me for a little while. Wow. I was like, uh, I mean, I actually found a supplement in the toilet and I was like, that can't be good. I had heard about that happening with, you know, cheap supplements, whatever right. that like the guys that own porta potty talk about sucking all the vitamins out of the porta potty. Right. And I thought, no, I'm I'm taking good stuff. Like this should not be happening. And um so I contacted my nutritionist right away and he was like, You gotta be kidding me. That's supposed to be impossible. And I was like, I don't know what to tell you. Here it is. I mean, not digested at all. Like the coating wasn't even off of it. And so he called his sales rep for that particular company. That sales rep did not believe him. He was like, do you know this patient? Are they trying to pull one over on you? Like this should not be possible. These are designed to dissolve in water in 45 minutes. 
So wow. he's like, maybe you so got a your bad batch. It, and... it did. Wow. He had me do a little experiment and being a homeschool mom that I was, I yes. took it a little, <laughs> couple steps further. He said, put it in water. Um, Cause I knew what supplement it was because I was only taking one that was that particular shape. Um, he said, put it in water. So I put one in vinegar too. Cause I was like, you know, right. stomach yeah. acid, let's right. see. And uh, he said, give it a little stir every 15 minutes and, and let me know. So I stirred them 15 minutes. Um, the one that was in water had started to kind of come apart a little bit. Okay. Um, but the one in the vinegar, interestingly, hadn't. Um, so after huh. 45 minutes, sure enough, the one that was in water was breaking up into powder. The coating was all open. The one that was in vinegar was not. It had just started to just open just a tiny bit. Interesting. <clears throat> You'd think right. be totally different. Uh-huh. I did. He said that, well, that particular supplement was encoded with a special coating to get it through your stomach acid so that it could be delivered to the intestines. Got it. So there wasn't enough liquid in your intestines or what? Yeah, well, that, Maybe what it that. turned out to be, which, I mean, we were both just befuddled at first, but I did a stool test where it checks, I mean, this one was super comprehensive. It's called a GI map. It's a particular yes, stool yeah. test. And they, te I mean, everything that's going on in there, every kind of individual strain of bacteria checks for funguses, parasites, protozoas, uh, oh. everything in there. Um, even opportunistic uh, bad guys, of course. Um, right. So I found out from that, that I had an overgrowth of H. pylori bacteria. Oh, wow. So H. pylori is naturally found in your stomach. And it is a bacteria, it kind of like lies in wait. You're, when you eat, you know, the stomach acid comes out and, and, um, and it does what it's supposed to. The H. pylori kind of comes out and helps uh, dissolve the food and stuff. And okay. then, uh, well, wait, no, I think the H. pylori comes out first, then the stomach acid. So the stomach acid then kills the H. pylori after it's done its job and kind of keeps it in check. Okay. If you have an overgrowth of H. pylori, this can lead to stomach ulcers. Now, wow. I did not have a stomach ulcer yet. I did not write. <laughs> yeah. I did not know that really anything was amiss in my intestines at all. I wasn't having any of the typical symptoms that you would have. Right. Except for a supplement going all the way through. Wow. So anyway, once we found that out, he was like, well, that makes sense. So your stomach is not producing enough acid so it's not killing the h pylori after it comes out and does its job so it just continues to grow and grow and grow wow so i wasn't digesting my food i had also kind of mysteriously lost about 10 pounds during that time which i was just thinking oh cool yeah right Great. i didn't even really try <laughs> uh, but then i was like oh yeah this is not good no, like yeah. i'm not Right, because you're not getting any nutrients out of what was already there or your supplements either. In your right, which was form. a real bummer. Yeah. <laughs> I was spending all that money on all those supplements and they weren't doing any good. Yeah. So I had to go through a pretty rigorous treatment for the H. pylori because it, it just, it takes a while. You're going to wow. take some really nasty tasting stuff. And it's about a three month process to get it back in check. And, um, and then you have to wait three months of doing nothing and then retest to see if you got it all. Oh, wow. But, so, but there's supposed to be some in there. It's just not the overgrowth. Right. And right. To test to make sure your levels are where they're where supposed the, to be. Yeah. Cause I, we had an anti, we, we did an anti candida diet because mm -hmm. we had an overgrowth of candida in our family. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's the kind of the same thing. It's like, did, you, it's very did, intense. did, we, did we balance it properly? Mm -hmm. And, and yeah and then not to overfeed it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, for sure. That's, that's, um, so I guess that moves us into a, another really good conversation of, you know, we, we sometimes have overgrowth of things in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of people talk about detoxing. Mm -hmm. So what is detoxing and when and why should we do it? So detoxification, if you think about just the root words, homeschool moms love the yes, root words, right? Exactly. <laughs> D and then toxins, right? So you're, you're taking out the toxins. So I think of it as giving your body a break, 
okay. from toxins. Um, you're giving your body a break from taking in any toxins because we just, we do right. on a daily basis. Yeah, we're no breathing matter. air that no, has icky right. chemicals in it. We're probably using, you know, products, shampoos and lotions and makeup and stuff on our body that has some icky stuff in it. We're eating food that undoubtedly has icky stuff in it. So all these things are going into your body. So a toxin I would classify as anything that your body can't use, anything okay. that it doesn't need. Yeah. So these things, I mean, our organs are made to, you know, clean some stuff right. and, and exactly. do a good job, but they need some help. You kind of right. think of a detox as like changing the oil. Okay. You know, yeah. you'll change the oil. You'll also change the oil filter mm -hmm. and get your engine running again like it's supposed to. So I think detox is an important part of your overall health picture. So during a detox, you would try to eliminate taking in as okay. many toxins as you possibly can. So this right. would mean eating all organic. Um, this would mean eating really only vegetables and things that are very easy for your body to okay. process so that it's it's not working hard on digesting. It can focus all of its energy on the detoxification process. So you might do like yeah. juices and um, smoothies and stuff like that um, just to make things really, really easy on your body, just to give it a break. I mean, even as far as, you know, some resting, you might incorporate some other things like a detox foot bath or, you know, a sauna, those kind of things to, to help your body get as much out as possible. Right. Yeah. Cleans out the liver. Your liver is like a great big filter. That's kind of the oil filter in your body. It does a lot of um, it does most of the heavy yeah. lifting for for toxins and stuff. So you give the liver a break because it's probably got a bunch of junk built up in there. And yeah. then if you're not taking any more in, it can process all the stuff that's already in there and get back to a good place. Right. So how often is it recommended that you do kind of like a, a detox? And I mean, like I that. think you could you could find recommendations that are all over the place. My nutritionist that I see, he recommends 42 days out of the year. Okay. You could break that up Perfect. however you want. He typically will do like two 21-day ones at a time. Okay. Um, but if, you know, you find what works for you, if yeah. it's one one week out of the month, and you do that every other month. I mean, that get, kind of gets you to the to the same goal. Right. I think it would also depend just where you are on your health journey. Yeah. Some people have tried a detox and it was a dumpster fire, flaming oh. disaster. Oh, no. You know, they felt terrible. I mean, the first time my husband did one, he had serious flu-like symptoms for the first three days. I mean, he wow. was feverish. He had chills. He was throwing up. He had diarrhea. And I was like, what is happening? Like, this is not good because I wasn't right. having those same symptoms. And I thought, did he just really get sick or what? Yeah. So I'm talking to the nutritionist and he's like, well, um, let's talk about his past a little bit. Oh. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, he said that that stuff's got to come out at some point. Wow. Because there had been years of, you know, smoking or nicotine use and even, you know, drug use, alcohol use um, before. Mm -hmm. And this was his first detox ever to do. So there was... So your little, body just kind of like puts it in compartments and mm -hmm. hides it away. And mm -hmm. there, there has to be a process to get it out. For sure. Wow. And since that was the first one that he had ever done, I mean, it was kind of a good thing. It showed you like the detox is working, right? Like this, exactly. this stuff is yes. coming out that it's supposed to, but we're like, okay, that was a little too much too soon. Right. So we, we kind of just modified and tweak things a little bit um, to make it a little bit easier for his body to handle. So don't mm -hmm. think that if you had some symptoms like that, well, I shouldn't detox. That was horrible. You know, that right. I'm not going to do that again. Yeah. Um, that would actually be like the opposite conclusion <laughs> to come to. Right. You just need to be able to tweak things a little bit to to just make it a little bit easier for your body to handle. Start easier, just start a little bit slower. And I think that points to also that it, it's probably really good advice to be doing this under the supervision of a professional mm -hmm. that knows what you're going to possibly run into and why mm -hmm. that those symptoms are coming about. Because we can, we can conclude that, well, this just isn't for me. And I think a lot of times we do that because we hit those bumps and, well, it should just be easy, right? It's mm -hmm. because I'm not putting anything bad in, so nothing bad should be coming 
mm-hmm. <laughs> about. So, yes. Right. And you saw a cool detox on YouTube and, you know, these people are doing it and it sounds fun and it sounds easy. And I'm not saying, you know, to not ever do that, but if I need some plumbing fixed at my house, I am going to call a plumber because that is expertise that I do not have. Right. And I may think, I watched a video on YouTube about how to change this part of the toilet, right? (laughs) So I may think that I'm doing it right, but because I've never done it before, I I don't know all there is to know about that. Right. So things you might run into that were buried. (laughs) Right. Within your system. Right. I mean, this is why we have people doing all these different jobs. When you need that expertise, go to a person who's trained for that, just like you would in in any other area of your life. So who would you go to? I know you've mentioned functional doctors and I know what a functional doctor is, but maybe my my audience does not. What's the difference between like what you'd get with a functional doctor? What what would you look for in a chiropractor that could help in this or um, a nutritionist? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I could speak to chiropractor and nutritionist better. I think you could probably speak to functional doctor a little bit better. So for a nutritionist, I would be looking for someone who is very centered on me and doing what my body needs and like looking at me in particular, because everyone is so different. I mean, we know this, right? We all different diets work for different people. And I mean, just like we all have different taste in clothes, like our body functions differently. Your yeah, metabolism absolutely. is different. So I would want somebody who was giving me a very individualized plan and not just, you know, a blanket. Well, this is what I tell everybody to do. Yes. Right. Um, I'd also want somebody who was willing to listen to me. And if I've already done some work, you know, I've already done some research, some things that I've already tried and I would have some input, you know, just get us a little further down the road. I right. definitely want them to be open to listening to, exactly. to what I have to say and just input along the way instead of, you know, do you go into the visit and the doctor's just like blah, 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 talking right, and, and you talking a thing. <laughs> and, and you don't get to address your concerns? No. I mean, I always say every time you're going to see a doctor, especially or any of these people that we go to for their expertise, right. have a list of questions ready, a list of your concerns, whatever you want to address Absolutely. so that you don't forget or get, right. you know, go down mm-hmm. some rabbit hole and forget what you're what you're talking about. Exactly. Especially if they're one of those people that does have a lot to say, because then you're like, well, what, what was my question? Because they're Mm -hmm. so off topic now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. A lot of times too, I'll voice record the appointment so I can listen to it later because probably I missed something or forgot a little detail of something. So I have found that to be very helpful. helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would also want to know that somebody, um, had some resources there for me. Um, I would want to know that they were not just basically selling me, you know, a particular product or even a particular line of products yes. that they could. I mean, cause then you, you just feel they're more like a salesman, so, right, you know, exactly. than a doctor. They're just doing natural medications <laughs> mm-hmm. versus, you know, going to the regular doctor to just get, Medicaid. Right. But who could appreciate that, you know, that there's more than one brand of supplements that's good. Right. Um, there's even more than one way. Like, are they only talking about supplements or are they also, can they appreciate uh, the role of essential oils or exactly. could they appreciate some other kinds of therapies, acupuncture, you know, chiropractic, all, all these other kinds of things. I just want to have a holistic approach. Yes, yes. Instead of just, you know, a very narrow scope. Right. Yeah. Yes. No, and good. I think um, in a chiropractor, I would be looking for someone who is trained again, specifically to treat me, that they're going to evaluate me. And I would like for them, me personally, for them to be able to do that by touch and feel yes. rather than x-rays, just because I don't really like x-rays uh, yeah. unless they're absolutely necessary right. so that they can touch and feel where things are out of alignment. Um, I mean, I've been to a chiropractor before where I just felt like it was like an assembly line. Yes. You just, right. it was rack them and crack them. You know, everybody came in and you basically got the same adjustments and you did the same thing. And, and then you, you left. I didn't feel like it was 
no, individualized. You were back and needed to be cracked again the next day mm-hmm. <laughs> or earlier than that. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I mean, there are there are less than practitioners in every area. Correct. Less than plumbers who are mm-hmm. just going to, you know, tell you it's this huge problem when it's really not. I mean, we've all been to that mechanic who tells you you need a whole new transmission when right. it's really not that big of a deal. So, you know, go some from some recommendations from some friends and stuff like that exactly. to to find one. And I mean, I would take the time to even interview somebody right. um, if possible, probably over the phone. They might do that to just get a, an idea of their philosophy and make sure because, idea. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're probably going to be spending a lot of money and certainly a lot of time with this person. So there has to be some trust and yes, absolutely. built up there. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'd have to add that the functional doctor is more if you have more medically um, related types of things. Because mm-hmm. when I was diagnosed with cancer, that's when I w- went to a functional doctor because they mix the kind of the Chinese medicine with regular medicine and give you alternatives that are much more holistic than like my breast surgeon did mm-hmm. and the the guy that wanted to put me on tamoxifen and you know all mm-hmm. these things that the the hospital and the the the, um, the the specialist that I went to said, well, this is the only way or you're going to die. Um, <laughs> and I wanted some other alternatives <laughs> than, than what they were giving me because I was like, well, this bottle says there's a percentage that I'm going to die in here too. Right. <laughs> so what is what else can I look into? Mm-hmm. And, and so, so functional doctors usually have that MD um, training, but then they look at alternatives to supplement what would be done in a regular practice. Mm-hmm. So that, um, oh, that reminds me too. Well. There's also, there's MDs, you know, and then there's DCs, which is doctor of chiropractic. There's also DOs, oh. doctors of osteopathy, which are typically a lot more holistically minded. Um, probably a lot of, uh, functional medicine doctors are probably DOs. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's good to know. So something to look for if you're, you're looking to maybe make a change in that area. So, Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we wanted to talk a little bit. We, we, um, um, I see we don't have any questions yet, but if you do have questions or comments, we do have viewers, um, and you want to ask, we're, we're talking about kind of nutrition, holistic, um, just, how do you take, take care of yourself? We were kind of went on deficiencies and detoxing and then, then got off on to how to find somebody to help you with that. Um, but, but we were going to take a question from one of our audience members that wrote in ahead of time. And cause we're going to f- kind of move towards, you know, well, what do we do if we're busy? And cause we're busy homeschool parents, how do I make these changes, um, that work? And so, um, Stacy wrote in and said, considering many special needs families follow a gluten-free dairy-free diet to reduce inflammation and optimize health. Do you have any quick breakfast ideas for this possibly vegan or a super start breakfast? Well, the first thing I would say to that is think outside the box a little bit and just broaden your idea of what breakfast actually is. Uh, Good idea. Yes. yes. (laughs) Because we (laughs) tend to think just in America, okay, it's cereal or it's pancakes or it's, you know, fruit or something. I mean, who says you can't have a salad for breakfast? Yeah. Or who says you can't have a, a sandwich for breakfast? Yeah. So just broaden the scope a little bit. Okay. So maybe even some of the same things that you would eat for lunch or you would eat for dinner, you can yeah. eat for breakfast. Uh, one of my favorites, one of my kids' favorites is a chia pudding. Okay. Which is, a, I mean, a pudding, it could also be a dessert item, which seems to be popular for breakfast, right? right. Cookie crisp and yes. all these other <laughs> super sugary things that we eat for breakfast. Uh, but chia pudding is really a good one, super duper simple to make. I mean, it's like a five minute prep and I'm sure you can find a bazillions of recipes online for it. But the basic idea is you take chia seeds and you soak them overnight in whatever milk it is that you like. And they all work. You can soak them in water. It just wouldn't taste like anything. Right. But so coconut milk, almond milk, cashew milk, whatever you like. Um, my kids prefer chocolate almond milk. Yes. <laughs> um, but you could also just put cocoa in there for That's, a little bit less yeah. sugar. Mm-hmm. 
or sometimes I cut it like the unsweetened milk with the chocolate. So you get the, you know, chocolate flavor, but it's still easy. Right. So anyway, you soak those overnight, the little chia seeds all plump up and, um, and then it basically eats like pudding. It's a little bit, um, you can just check the ratio for, um, the cups of chia seeds to cups of liquid. I forget what the magic ratio is, okay. but to get it the consistency that you like. Right. But that one's a good one. Easy to eat even on the go. It's got a nice texture to it. it texture like pudding with a, a little bit of right. crunch in there, yeah. but that one's a fun one. And then you could, of course, top it with whatever, whatever. Yeah. fruit toppings, yeah. nut toppings. I do think that in the morning, getting protein first thing in the morning is right. super important. I mean, I know she was asking for point. vegan options. I mean, eggs are my absolute favorite and my go-to, probably because I have my own chickens in the backyard. Yes, so, so you got good eggs. <laughs> those are real real good eggs. Um, but I think um, even oatmeal is really good, and that's right. um, overnight oats are are a good option. Also pretty mm -hmm. quick too, to yes. where you're soaking the oats, just like you soaked the chia seeds. You right. can even and combine do, them. Yeah. I do chia seeds in my overnight. Mm -hmm. oats, so. Yeah. I give it a little fun texture and stuff like that. And then, um, I, I've seen a lot of times that have like all these little mason jars and you can fill up and make them, you know, for a few days at a time. Right. I mean, that's easy. That's a time saver. And then the kids can just grab them grab and them. then put their particular topping that they want on them. Slice some bananas, slice some strawberries, whatever, put on top. I'm yeah. yeah. um, even mix in like a, a tablespoon or two of peanut butter. Oh, to yeah. another Extra way to, to get some protein kind of in. butter that you wanted to put in there. Mm -hmm. that's and oatmeal yeah. is also super easy to make like in a, in a real big batch. If you have a lot of kids, crock pot, oh, put it in yes. overnight. You've got oatmeal for everybody in the morning. Right. Yeah. So that's a good one. Yeah. And then you can just add like nuts on top of it to add mm -hmm. that protein or whatever else that mm -hmm. you want separately. That's a great idea. Yeah. So do you have any other um, suggestions for like busy nutrient dense, dense foods? <laughs> oh gosh. Specific foods. I'm a big nut eater myself. Yeah. I like all of the nuts pretty much. And so I'm always having, uh, you know, a bag of almonds. I've always got a bag of cashews. I've always got a bag of pistachios on, on hand. Those are easy to take. They're high in protein. Right. And, you know, I can feel good about those. Of course, they're even better for you if they're, if they're not roasted. It takes a little adjusting, I think, palate wise to, to want to eat almonds straight or, yeah. you know, other the ones. Sprouted ones tend to be. A little more palatable for me than the raw ones. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I like those too as well. Almonds, I think they're even a little bit sweet when they're not roasted and salted. But um, right. yeah, I love having um, nuts on hand. We also eat a lot of beans. We don't um, eat a ton of meat at our house. So so I'm a big bean person. Again, I like all the beans. I like black beans mm -hmm. and pinto beans and navy beans and kidney beans and yeah. all the yeah. beans. So those are fun to to mix up. And um, I mean, I've just really had a good time with my Instant Pot later. Oh, okay. I feel like it allows me to be totally irresponsible and forget. <laughs> I can have a thought about dinner all day. And right. then what I can go from like frozen chicken parts to dinner in like wow. about an hour with that thing. And it makes beans really fast. You don't have to soak them overnight before like, you know, you do with their okay. crock pot. Yeah. Um, in the instant pot, they, yeah, you can go from dry beans to ready to eat in an hour. Very cool. So that's amazing. I, I love the instant pot. In fact, I just bought myself another like instant pot cookbook for Okay. All the things that, yeah. all the different things that right. you can make in there. And, yeah. Right. And I think really for me too, the planning is right. a crucial component, which I don't do very well at all. When I do, <laughs> it's great. It's fantastic. Right. It's just like, instead of it swirling through my brain all day, what am I going to make for dinner? What oh, am I, I going to make for that. dinner? What am Absolutely I going to make for dinner? That, yes. If you plan, it's just done. And then you can just execute the plan. Exactly. So I know it's a pain in the butt. I really hate doing mm -hmm. it. But once you do it, that is what makes life easier for the whole week. Right. Exactly. And then you feel like I'm making good choices instead of, I just mm -hmm. decided in the last 30 minutes, this is what we're going to eat. And it wasn't the best choice, but it's 
got food on the table mm-hmm. and, and that's not where we want to be. Cause in the long run, we are always cutting ourselves short mm-hmm. of those good, nutritious, you know, meals that we could be making. And we, we have the time for, but we do have to plan ahead of time. And yeah. Yeah. My bean hack is I, uh, I have a mill, so I put my dry beans in there and make powder out of them and I can make, oh. I can make anything with bean powder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, mm-hmm. you can make dips, you can make gravy with it instead of flour. And yeah. So I feel like cauliflower these days too. You can make anything out of cauliflower. Right, exactly. Right? Yes. Rice, and pancakes and pizza crust and everything. You make yeah. everything out mm-hmm. of cauliflower. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So we are in the holiday season right now. I know when this podcast comes out, we'll be beyond that. Um, So I'll address that in my next question. But for those that are watching live and will watch through the holiday season, you know, we just have holiday gatherings and food that we we regret eating. (laughs) And it doesn't mean we have to throw everything out of our diet. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? But then how do we you know, start making those changes even during this season. Mm -hmm. Holidays are tricky for everybody because it seems like every gathering is based around food, right? You're getting together for a meal or it's cookie exchange or there's candy just flowing from everywhere. So it is very difficult. So you definitely need to make a plan and have a plan ahead of time or you're just going to be you know, drag down the river with everybody else doing what everybody else is doing. (laughs) Yeah. So maybe my (laughs) best tip would be be a picky eater. Okay. If you could limit yourself to just the things that you normally eat, you probably won't fall off the wagon so much. Right. Now, again, on holidays, there are a lot of special foods that you don't have at other times. Right. Yes, exactly. And what our tendency is to be like, well, it's the holidays, you know, I'll right. do it this once. But then there's like 17 holiday parties right. that you go to. So you're like, I'll do it this uh, once. Well, this 17 yeah. times. Right. And yeah. before you know it, you know, you've gained weight and all this kind you of stuff. So it and yes, you're cranky. and uh, <laughs> Yeah, not a good place to be. So having a plan ahead of time um, is, is a really good idea. For me, I am picky eater. So that that helps because right. I don't just dive into whatever is there. I'm like, what is that? What's 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 in that? Because I don't right. like bell peppers and I don't eat pork and you know some stuff yeah. like that. So that eliminates a lot of things right, right there. But I think, um, I mean, you've heard it said before. You know, if you're going to indulge in something just a little bit, what your mind really wants is the taste of it. Right. It doesn't need an entire slice of pie to uh, get the feeling yes. and the effect of the pie. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so half it, half yeah. it with someone or just have the, you know, the little bite of something. Another rule I have for myself um, is, well, I don't eat anything white, not only because it's probably white sugar or white flour or whatever, but right. I don't know, white things just kind of weird me out. So I don't okay. like to eat especially bright white things. I don't, I just feel like that's not natural. No. It shouldn't be bright white. There's very few things that, yeah, grow. That and way. if it, <laughs> if it comes to desserts for me too, um, I don't eat anything unless it's chocolate. Okay. Like yeah. that's just well, you my might rule. as well be discerning. If you're going to, you know, say I'm going to indulge in something, mm-hmm. I'm going to make it what I really, really want. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To me, yeah. it's not worth the calories and everything. If it's not going to be something that I really enjoy. So just last night we were out to dinner for a, my board for my homeschool co-op and we were at a nice a farm to table restaurant. It was so good and having all these yummy foods. Right. But for dessert, they had two choices and neither one of them were chocolate. So I was oh. like, well, I guess tonight's just not my night. Yeah. So I, I right. told myself when I get home, I'll have one of my little dark nice. chocolate truffles. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. And that was enough, you know. Right. Yeah. I, I think it it really is the mind that because mm-hmm. we, we were at a, our, so Leslie goes to my church and we had a women's gathering and there was nothing my daughter and I could eat because we eat vegan and gluten free. And I also don't do any sugars either. And so there was, <laughs> it was just, no, there's nothing here for you, but it was that, okay, so we are here to enjoy being around other people. Mm -hmm. And then when we go home, we made a full dinner Mm -hmm. and then we ate that when we got home. But again, it's, I'm not going to have an awful time just because I 
what I've limited myself to Mm -hmm. for various reasons, um, that isn't the purpose of the gathering. Mm -hmm. And right. It kind of gives you something to do while you're there. Right. But it's not the point. And especially, you know, if you know that you have food issues like that, right. I mean, you know, if you eat vegan, I mean, that's, that's hard. Not very many people are doing that or even having any, I mean, there was literally nothing that yeah. y'all could eat. There was like right. no vegetable, anything. Cause I was <laughs> like, could they at least have a vegetable platter or fruit? And there was nothing. I mean, funny. not even the little tray of like carrot sticks and, <laughs> and broccoli or whatever. Right. But I mean, for stuff like that, if I know I'm just not a good buffet person either. Cause again, I am right. kind of picky. I will just have at least a snack before I go. That way I'm not hungry when I get there and then feel the need to eat something just because I'm starving, you know, and I'm going to eat something that I shouldn't or that I didn't want to. And then, you know, put myself in a bad position. I mean, I'm lucky that I don't have any food sensitivities or, you know, serious allergies or anything. But if you're in that boat, then you're going to pay for it. So prepare ahead of time. That's true. Yeah. Eat ahead of time or like, you know, this could have been a special fun thing. You know, it's you and your daughter with both the same food dishes and you'll Mm -hmm. be like, Hey, we'll just go out to this place that we like afterwards or, you know, something like that and still make it fun, still make it special, but not, you know, not totally regret it and not feel like you're, you're missing out. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And (laughs) that can happen so much. And we, yeah, we don't want to limit ourselves just because our food ends up being limited. And I know a lot mm-hmm. of people in our community, they have some sort of dietary needs. Like we ran this family camp this last summer and more people than not who registered had dietary needs. And mm-hmm. so I'm sitting there working with the cook going, well, and then he's like, and how many people? And I'm like counting down the list. And some people had like six in there. And I'm like, okay, so this person makes that list and that list. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. just it's insane. But um, but it was nice that we were able to accommodate that too. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, it's not not often you have that. Um, so we are, oh man, we're, <laughs> we're, we're just about out of time. I wanted to talk a little bit about setting healthy goals, mm-hmm. you know, into the new year and, and how, how would, um, how would you approach that? You know, saying, okay, I've heard all this, I am convicted and I, you know, I'm going to do my best through the holidays, but I, I really want to start making some definite changes mm-hmm. into the new year. What, where's a good place to start? I think a good place to start is with prayer yes. and ask God really what he has for you because he wants the best for you. Yeah, He wants you on a path of health and wellness so that you can serve and do all the things that you're supposed to do for him. Absolutely. And just like you would pray about any other situation, I mean, it says, why would he not give good gifts to his children? Exactly. If you ask for wisdom, he's going to give it to you. Yeah. So ask God to tell you, what does he want you to do? Absolutely. And, and maybe even before that, can we plan to not gain any weight over the holidays <laughs> so that we don't, you know, have like more or to too lose? Too many toxins when the detox happens. <laughs> right. Because I think a lot of people really, they just throw caution to the wind for November, December and say, you know, I'll, I'll deal, I'll with, deal it with it in January. Yes. Well... I'm not sure how that works out uh, on an ongoing basis. So I'd say just really pray about it and ask God for direction because, I mean, you know, there's so many things out there, so many different diets to try, so many different directions to go. You could just keep blindly trying everything and, you know, seeing if it all works. But again, if you could just have God tell you, you know, you ask him. He will tell you. He will. Yes. It's yes. a journey to be on, right? Um, yeah. And and not to say that he's going to tell you, you know, right away, flashing neon sign, <laughs> this is the diet that you need to do and you're going to do that diet and everything's going to be fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I, I wish it worked wish. like that yes. for all the all the things that we have to pray about. But sometimes right. the journey for you is going through the process of, yes. of learning. Faith. Definitely. Mm-hmm. And see what he has for you because maybe... I mean, maybe your goals aren't realistic. I think that, I mean, that's, um, I love to do all the new year stuff and set goals and have all these things. And my husband is like, boo, we're not doing any of that stuff. So I just kind (laughs) of keep it to myself. But I think for a goal, you know, make it a little bit challenging, but attainable. Right. Um, That way it feels, it gives you some motivation to do it instead of just knowing right away. It's totally 
out of reach and you're never going to do it. Yeah. I think it also really helps to, to have a buddy. Oh, absolutely. Either, you know, your spouse that you can do something together with a friend who's going to do it with you just yeah. for accountability and um, whether it's a detox or whether it's a, you know, a new diet plan. And, you know, there's like Facebook groups and stuff right. for all these yeah. different things just to get some community around you. Yeah. Because we're not meant to be alone, of course. Right. But that gives you just some mental support, emotional support um, to do whatever it is that you want to do. And I'd say make it um, whatever the goal is. You know, if you're trying to lose, say, 15 pounds or something like that. Right. I mean, make sure that that is actually attainable and make give yourself some checkpoints along the way instead of, I'm going to lose 15 pounds by March or something. Right. And like, you don't weigh yourself until then, you know, give it checkpoints along the way to make sure that you're making some progress and um, going along your goal. And don't be afraid to to tweak it. You start going, doing something, right. it might mm-hmm. work for a while and then start to not, well, yeah, tweak it. Right. And, and keep praying about it the entire time and, and God will lead and yes. he will guide you. Yeah. Great advice. Absolutely. Love. Good way to end. So, yes. So, so much good advice. And thank you so much, Leslie, for, for thank sharing. Thank you so much for this having was, me. It's been fun. This was a good conversation. Mm-hmm. And um, and hopefully it blessed you as much as it blessed us. <laughs> and um, and so, yeah, we've been focusing on parent care this month. And we have one more conversation still um, coming up this Friday, actually. And um, my friend Lisa is going to be over for that. And she has walked with me on my cancer journey. And she was the one who introduced me to a functional doctor. I had no idea what that was. Um, but she has spoken a lot of truth into my life a lot. And I'm just super excited to share her with you as well as um, some of these other ladies that have joined me um, this month on our broadcast. And, and so, so join me back again for that time and, um, and then just keep praying about it. Like Leslie said, you know, it, God, God will lead and guide and, and he will not fail you. You just have to keep trusting him and, mm-hmm. and he will do well. So, so thanks so much. Um, this, this was a great conversation. We, we definitely filled more than an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yep. And we'll, we'll see you all back here for the next show. So have a great rest of your week. God bless. And we'll see you then. Bye everybody. Bye. take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on this podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you'll find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more. This has been Empowering Homeschool Conversations with Peggy Ployer. Quick question. Would you consider yourself a founder, innovator, or trailblazer on mission to grow, show, and share your faith through creative pursuits like speaking, writing, or testifying? Perhaps even as an entrepreneur. If the answer is at all yes, I'd love to invite you to my Audible gym, the Fit and Faith Podcast. I'm Tamara Andress. I'll be your trainer. Don't worry. This isn't a sweaty fitness podcast. This is where you will be mentally, emotionally, financially, and spiritually flexing as we endure, shape, and sharpen our skills to be messengers for the kingdom. Let's get fit in faith.